I'm Matthew Barr. I'm an architect at Akamai. Um, come on. Let's see. Forward. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about our experience building a uh, enterprise Git uh, repository uh, in terms of what we used and some of the thing, interesting areas that we came and problems we came into it. First, I am not a lawyer. I'm not compliance. I'm not internal audit. I'm not a PCI assessor or a QSA. I'm not the mama. I am the daddy. Okay. I've been a sysadmin and or a DevOps engineer for the last 20 years. I've been at MarketServe, Lehman Brothers, both financials. I've gone to startups and dating sites, uh, as well as Nokia. And my focus of my team at Akamai is on developer productivity. That's the actual name, team name. We really provide tools for our engineers. Those are our only customers. We do not actually work with external customers. Uh, and we offer and provide the SCM tools, the build system, continuous integration, and test systems. And I'm currently working on a new horizontally build, scalable build system with utilizing Docker and probably Jenkins and some other tools. So getting a little bit back further to my roots as a system in despite some diversions into project managing and product owning a website and a web app. So, does anyone actually remember this game? So you wanna be a hero? Yeah, okay, fine. Um, so, you have a couple of ways right now, everyone knows that you can go ahead and host your code outside in the cloud. So, two of the major options right now are GitHub and Bitbucket, they're hosted, Great features, low cost, low overhead, great for small teams, et cetera. Now, there's also some self-hosted options, GitLab, Gitalite, Seagit. Some of them are varying differences, uh, and these are non-commercial. These are the open source uh, products. There's also the open source, uh, the enterprise editions of some of these, uh, and this is not all of them, but it at least is probably some of the major ones. I'm gonna focus on GitHub Enterprise, because it's the, everyone's heard of it from GitHub. And I know Bitbucket Server from Atlassian, because, well, it's Atlassian, first of all. It used to be called Swarm, uh, Stash, I mean. And I know it best because that's what I came into and what we ended up implementing and relaunching last year. So, uh, Git at Akamai, we currently have over 6,000 repositories. 150 projects uh, and organiza or organizations uh, from the GitHub world. It is actually not yet the primary code repository, and we can't even build for most of our deployments from it. So this is 6,000 before we really even fully roll out to the full company. Uh, we relaunched last year with a productionized, operationalized uh, system with using Stash Data Center, which is now called Bitbucket Server, uh, and we have two sites, one active, one passive, two app servers, two DB nodes, net app filers, and lib balancers. So, uh, a friend of mine actually at work coined this because, dear God, do you really want to write operationalization? Uh, having to be able to say it was a, a job requirement, we found out, uh, and it's amazing how many people stumble over that one. So, O16N is much easier, actually. So, focusing for initially on what does it take to operationalize some of the products that you purchase in. So Stash or, I'm gonna intermix Stash and Bitbucket Server, guys. I, I just tell you, it's gonna happen. We're still using the, uh, la the version from last year, which is 3.0 from, or 3.11 really, from uh, Atlassian, and they changed the name a year ago, and I have not yet actually gotten to the point of being seeing the new one, but, the HA and DR and geodiversity and backups. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Hopefully geodiversity, great. Okay. They vary, the features in these vary by product and I'm gonna focus both on, so for GitHub Enterprise, it comes with clustering as an option. I don't know if that actually has extra cost, by the way, so I'm sorry. Um, it does come built in with an active and passive node for disaster recovery and it includes point in time snapshots internally in the product uh, as just off the bat. Bitbucket server 
comes in two variants, which is one is a single hosted server and the other is a data center edition. The, um, it really relies on you providing a lot of more of the infrastructure yourself. So be aware of it. On the other hand, you pay a ton less. So good news, bad news. You also have to do the operationalization for it yourself in some cases. But um, like I said, self-service backups, you have to do self-service da database replication and also snapshots if you want those to point in time recoveries. Uh, we're using NetApp for that uh, to do some of this. On the, and now, the nice thing is in the last year they've introduced smart mirrors, uh, which is something that GitHub uh, doesn't have, which allows you to have geodiversity in terms of having mirrored systems, replicas, read-only replicas anywhere else in the world you want that have a constantly kept updated copy of all the repositories you may want. You can select which ones you want to keep updated, or it can be all of it, but you can actually keep, so with Git, you can actually tell it where to read from and where to write. The nice thing is you can actually tell it to read from your local server, maybe in your region, if you're in India, if you're in Israel or Europe, and you're, for the master is actually in, say, Dallas or in Massachusetts, this can be really helpful. And then you can only submit the writes. In most cases, your writes are gonna be a lot smaller. You're not doing large files for the most part, although it does now have large file support, to back to the source, to the master. And so you're able to get things a lot faster now. Now, this turns out to be really important when you're talking about adding a CI build system, especially at scale. Start adding 15,000 jobs and, uh, or something like that uh, and builds happening constantly with large amounts of data being transferred. Full, you know, in most cases, the CI system, you're gonna do a full checkout each time because you're not using the same build slave. You know, if you've got 100 build slaves, what are the odds that the same job will get run on the same server the same time, right after each other, without having to go ahead and check out a full copy again? Pretty darn low, actually. So, unlike for a developer where you might only grab, you know, the delta of the objects in Git, you're actually gonna be pulling a lot of the code every time. They also introduced zero time count backups, kind of helpful, turns out, because having to turn your application off for a minute or two just to back it up means you can't do it every hour. You also can't do it, you know, maybe you'll do it once a day, if you're lucky. Getting approval to take one minute out of every hour is just not going to happen. Um, so, another area that was important to us was authentication for the enterprise. Now, uh, I, we have a mandate internally that we don't use passwords uh, on the actual uh, application servers at all. We have a central uh, SSO system that we authenticate to, and then that gives us access and grants via SAML access to most of our other web apps and things like that. Well, for some of these tools, that's great for the website, but what about command line and things like that? So you have to go ahead and deal with three different types of access for Git. Now, this is more complicated for things like, say, this also applies to things like, say, Artifactory or Nexus, uh, and then also for things like static analysis tools like Coverity or Clockwork, uh, as well as a host of other things that are out there. Well. In this case, we had the web UI, we had Git over SSH or over HTTPS. In our case, we're actually shutting down HTTPS for the most part for, to use SSH. And then you have API access, which is really important to your developers, it turns out. Uh, please don't block them out of that. It really makes life easier, especially for things like CI tooling, uh, release engineering, and things along those lines. Don't cripple your developers, please. That's why you have these nice RESTful APIs. They're really nice. So we ended up using SAML in our company. Uh, but SAML is one option, there are others. Everyone's gonna say, what about LDAP? Well, the problem with LDAP is it's great for syncing the directory of users. It's not so great at keeping passwords off of the actual app servers themselves. You have to send the, app, the password to the app server so it can compare the LDAP credential. So, we actually can't use LDAP uh, authentication for things. We also store our SSH keys in 
a, an LDAP itself, it turns out. Uh, our public side are actually stored in LDAP as one of the extra fields in AD. And so we actually synchronize off of that every night to everyone's profile. Um, this is only one way to do it. I'm not necessarily seeing other ways, uh, but it is a decent option. It allows us to rotate our SSH keys every 90 days or so and not have the user have to worry about it. Uh, we do allow users to upload extra keys that don't get overridden, I think, but I'm not entirely sure about the overridden part. Now, there's also access keys for, say, a CI server or something like that that are not attached to a user that are separate and dealt with differently. Uh, we also use X509 client certs for API authentication pretty much across the board, which is in some ways better than, say, a, uh, a uh, access token, which is what GitHub uses, um, but allows you to go ahead and have expiring keys with much stronger uh, bindings and much stronger security policies. So now I'm gonna move into safety and best practices, and this is actually, you can also read this as some of the concerns we had around PCI and SOX, and we're also adding in now SOC 2, and who's heard of any of these things? Okay, that's good. Who exists in operations that have to worry about these? Isn't it fun? Um, so, sorry? <laughs> By the way, I'm doing okay on time, so if people wanna ask questions, feel free, raise your hand, and I will try to, I'll repeat your question back. But, so, PCI and SOX and all the others, in many cases for source code, really boil down to preventing unauthorized changes and review changes that have been made by the people who are authorized to make the changes. Now, this doesn't take into account what it means to make the server PCI scoped. PCI DSS 3.0 meant that we brought, felt our assessors and everyone else seems to feel that our build system and our source code system are now in scope itself not just the code that's in it, but the actual servers themselves are in scope. Uh, but I'm not talking about that. Uh, that really means you have to have things like firewalls, you have to patch your servers and things along those lines. But this is actually about the code side. So, first real thing there is, first thing to talk about here is doing code reviews. Well, how do you go ahead and get sign-offs uh, GitHub uses plus ones in a lot of places, but there's no real internal model for GitHub for having an approval that this pull request is actually the right thing. Now, I mentioned code review. We think pull requests are fantastic. Does anyone actually think not like pull requests? Nah, no one. No one's gonna fess up to it? Okay. Um, so, with pull requests, uh, Bitbucket server actually allows you to have an approval on the actual pull request, not just a reviewer. So that really allows you to store who actually said this was a good pull request. It also, both tools actually allow for the number, a combined number of builds that have to pass to be approved and merged, but uh, it really is beneficial for us to have the actual, con the model ex include the concept of an approver. We also want to make sure that people don't, uh, you, you need to be able to ensure that you don't actually merge without a pull request. So you can't commit, we actually say that you cannot commit to master, period. You must use a pull request to get code to master. You must use a pull request to get code out to a release branch or anything else that will become a tag and released. Uh, now, the, some of the developers actually hate this because it means you have all these nasty merge commits in master. We actually flipped around and said, guys, that actually is your proof of who did all the operations, who did the audit. And it becomes an audit point that actually can be easily related to. So when you do look at your Git log, you actually see this merge occurred with this pull request, and this is who approved it, and this was done, on the, and here's a URL to the actual pull request. And now you actually have the ability, even from a checkout, to find out what the audit trail was. Okay. 
Uh, another area, and this actually applies outside of, both of these really apply to teams that are not even PCI or SOX. It's just really best practices, in my opinion, to worry about making sure your code is safe. One of the areas that we did feel that we need to worry about is actually having code integrity. Branching workflows can get interesting. How do you make sure you don't lose code? How do you make sure no code isn't introduced into the system without all the appropriate controls? Well, the first thing I'm gonna mention is that we actually use a combination of Git flow and a feature branch workflow, or the GitHub workflow. So we don't actually, and we recommend to our users, we don't force it on everyone quite yet. But we recommend people use, don't use a develop branch, but use the master branch and then use feature branches in the master, and then have release branches that allow for real QA that are not continue, you know, then deploy off of that, tag that, and then uh, deploy. It also allows for skipping the release branch and going straight to CD, though. So if you just want to tag right off a of master or deploy right off a of master, no problem. Your master is always known to be a code reviewed and safe code. Safe being relative to not have, not meaning not have bugs. Uh, another area we need to worry about is protect your branches. Uh, you may want to control who can merge uh, code into the, the protected branches. So the master branch, the release branches. You need to know who's got permissions to do that. Um, we also make sure that people can't force push and or rewrite history on those protected branches. Because if you do that, if you can rewrite history, you can completely change the audit trail and get rid of audit trail. Um, another aspect, and this is I'm gonna call out at last on this one, is unapproving pull requests when someone actually changes the commit, adds a new commit to it. Turns out there's a plugin that they have for it, but really? You've got an approval. Why isn't automatically unapproved something when uh, it actually is changed? So hopefully we'll persuade them to actually change that in the future. Um, so, question for you guys: Who wrote your code? If you have, if you're using Git, how do you know who wrote it? Anyone? Git Great. How do you know? Who's the commit? You know who the committer is, you think. Is the committer the person that actually wrote the code? I, I'm not even saying if the committer is, I, I'm saying is the person, what happens if I change my commit name like this? It's just a git global. I can become God, I can become you and commit. There's no way in, get blamed for that to know the difference. Unless you're using GPG, and it looks like GitHub Enterprise just like a couple weeks ago just released verification of GPG signatures. There really isn't in any of these tools any ability to tell who actually made the change that it says made the change. So, turns out the tools do authenticate the, the pusher, however. The push operation, you have to go ahead and we know who did that. So what we're doing is actually logging a pair of the commits and the who pushed it. And that actually provides us a back trail if we have to. Um, because if someone introduces, say, a root kit or something like that and says, but, you know, but it looks like the chief architect introduced this. What are you talking about? Well, he didn't do it. Uh, and let's figure out who actually did it. Another area of concern here was actually access control. As you start adding thousands of repositories, you've got thousands of sets of actual different needs for access control. Well, the first thing people obviously think of is organizations or projects, uh, which are good, but let's say you need to have different uh, access controls for each project, for each part, part of a group. So one tech lead for one repo is one new person and who can merge things and another person might have another setting. Well, we can use LDAP groups to help with some of this, but in most cases, LDAP groups aren't actually editable on the tool. So you have to go back to your AD team 
or someone else to actually make a change to an LDAP group and create that. Uh, I'm not sure about y'all's y'all's world, but that always takes forever for us, so that's suboptimal. Um, we also need, as part of SOX and PCI, to know who manages and improves access to code, and we need to have the ability to audit access, in some cases quarterly for SOX and uh, yearly or so for PCI. Additionally, what about separations of concerns? How do you prove that ops can't modify code? And that drives some of us crazy. It's like antithetical to the DevOps concept in some ways, but when you're dealing with regulations, ops cannot change code, can have access to write to code if they want. That's the whole, that's one of the controls that's in so some of the controls in SOX. We're trying to go ahead and push our auditors back on that, but probably won't happen. You need to be able to prove who had access. So, some of this comes down to automation. Thank God for APIs for this stuff. You can, we also need to be able to configure new repositories with all the correct uh, controls. And we're also in the process of building out external front ends to this because some of these things are just too hard for the, uh, the actual tools to do in a way that really matches our business logic. Things like user management, because we don't want to give every user admin privileges, because they can change settings, we have to have a way for people to maybe set up, say, web hooks, uh, and some things that we do want the, the, ad, you know, the code owners to be able to change. And we also need to be able to do, uh, audit the settings. And so we have to have tools to audit settings and things like that. Uh, here are some references. Uh, I've linked the, Google doc, uh, the GitHub Enterprise docs and the Bitbucket Server docs. And thank you very much, and I will take questions. And, and I will be posting the slides to SlideShare probably a little bit. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it, there's actually, it's, we're actually hooking in on the, sorry. Uh, he asked if we're using, thank you very much. Uh, he asked if we're, how we're logging the Git pusher and the commits. Um, Right the second, I'm off the top of my head, I don't remember how they implement, but I'm pretty sure it's actually a post-receive action. Uh, hooks is a little weird because it's actually on the whole system level as opposed to a specific repository. So uh, the way Bitbucket Server or Stash implements that is slightly different. Uh, I'm not sure how GitHub Enterprise deals with this, but hooks really don't necessarily make sense on a single repository level because they're kind of hard to deal with. Uh, so if there's some universal, something has come in, log it, and that's how it, it gets handled. Oh no, all the self, all the enterprise ones, I'm sorry, is the Git Enterprise solution on-prem or cloud? Git Enterprise, in this case, all the uh, enterprise uh, options were on-prem, sorry. Uh, and I think Git Enterprise, their pricing page today says $29 a month a user. I do know that Stash Data Center which is probably the most comparable, our Bitbucket Server Data Center is about 25 a year. <laughs> Note the discrepancy of year versus month. Yeah. Uh, you get a lot, but, uh, oh, one other thing to note is that as far as I know, Bitbucket Server, you get source code, which is really nice to access to source code, and it also accepts plugins. You can really go in and modify what's happening very easily, and there's uh, plugins available. There's a marketplace, just like with Jira and Confluence. There's some really nice things out there. Uh, I don't, I know for sure GitHub does not provide you source code, and I don't think, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, they allow you to use plugins. So you get what you pay for, and, but you can't do anything else with it, whereas with Stash, we could do development to add features. We actually implemented Perforce um, and Bugzilla integrations, as well as other tools. So this, the committer hook was just a plugin that gets coded into it. So it's not really a big deal for us to do a lot of changes, UI changes, a lot of other things that are easy to do for us. No. So the question is, SSH keys and LDAP. We are not storing SSH keys, the private key on private side and LDAP. Uh, we actually have a tool that lets users upload uh, their SSH keys public side to um, effectively to our LDAP and gets that published out to a lot of other places, not just source control, 
but it's also used for our internal access to servers, and those get replicated out. They also go out to the deployed side to actually production systems if you need them. So uh, not the actual production servers get them, but they go to the authentication bastion daemons, sorry, bastion hosts, to get to, the jump hosts to get to the production servers, things like that. And we have different, we have multiple keys, by the way. Not one of them is good for everything. We have an internal, we have one for coming in from outside to the bastion host to get into the network. We also have one to go outward to the production servers. Uh, there's one for a different type for the knock for them to use on their protected laptops and things like that. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm at the time, but I'm happy to step here, and if you want to come up and ask me any questions, I'm happy to do so. Thank you very much. Hope you guys enjoyed it.